Hashem Nasser Ben Asliach, take two. <laughs> so, um, all right, so going back to the whole logic aspect of it, going back to the whole aspect of tshuva, again, the most important thing that I think we have to realize with our own life is that the less of our own logic we use, that's a, you know, the better we're going to be because all of the answers that we need are inside the Torah. Um, uh, one thing that um, we learned a few weeks ago in, uh, from Abraham when he did the Brit Milah, which we talked about last week, you know, Abraham when he did the Brit Milah, he was 99 years old. And he already went through several of Hashem's tests. And Hashem is telling him, you're going to have a son with Sarah, who's 90 years old. Now, had Abraham used his logic, not only would he have not listened to Hashem, but he would have, he would have thought that this whole concept of Hashem is just in his mind, because it doesn't make sense that someone that's 99 years old is going to have a child. Now, this wasn't the same as the people from the previous few generations, like the generations of Noah, where people used to live 500 to 1,000 years. In the time of uh, Avram, the oldest person to live at that time was his father, actually, Terach, who lived, I think, until he was 205 years old. But they used to say that, uh, as a joke, oh, yeah, maybe you'll live till, uh, you know, as much as Terach lived, which was like no one expected to really live 200 years anymore. So... Abraham was something really special, one of the greatest human beings that ever lived, because he eliminated his own logic and just followed what Hashem said. One of the th there was a few things that we learned from last week's parasha that also have the same to do, you know, something similar to do with logic, but also give us a little bit of insight about how Hashem works and how it's, when you really look at it, illogical. If you really believe in the real Hashem, if you really believe in that Hashem works, it's the same Hashem that's in the, uh, in the Torah, then you'll see that in his book, in the letter that he wrote us, in his instructions that he gave us, nothing is logical. So now last week's parashat, parashat Miketz, um, the, the basic story is that you have a, uh, a Joseph, uh, which is one of the 12 tribes, is uh, sitting in jail. Uh, and the whole parashat starts with uh, that this was two years after. And what, what does it mean by two years after? Is that it's two years after the last parashat that ended uh, when... Um, the two people that were uh, the cupbearer, uh, and uh, the two people that um, Joseph translated their dreams, one of them died, and the cupbearer actually went back to his position with Pharaoh. So now, uh, the cupbearer was technically supposed to tell Pharaoh about Joseph, but he he, he forgot, um, and Joseph ended up staying in jail for another two years, which was actually a punishment from Hashem, because at his level. He wasn't supposed to rely on men uh, and ask him for help. And he was supposed to pure, you know, just purely trust that Hashem will take him out when it's time. So at that time when he asked him to tell Pharaoh about him, he was already in jail for 10 years. And because he asked him, Hashem kept him in jail for another two years. So now the last week's parasha starts with Pharaoh dreams a dream. And calls all of his wise men and wizards to interpret his dream. No one can interpret his dream. And all of a sudden, this cupbearer that's working for Pharaoh that was in jail with uh, Joseph, remembers Joseph, and says, I remember this man that I was in jail with, and he knows how to interpret dreams. Okay, so that's the basic background of this parasha. Now, here's the logical part. 
at the beginning of once Pharaoh finds out about Joseph, it says, So Pharaoh sent and summoned Joseph, and they rushed him from the dungeon. In Hebrew it says, Vaishlach Pao Vikai Yosef Vayeritsuhu Min Abo. So the question is, why are they emphasizing the fact that they hurried up to bring Joseph to Pharaoh? What's, well, why? I mean, why did they say, okay, they brought him in. Pharaoh called him. They went and got him. They went and got Joseph. Why, are they, why is the Torah? The Torah never uses an extra word or the wrong word anywhere. Every word has a significance. So the answer to that is that it says that they hurried up is that the way that Hashem's reward and punishment system works is against all of our logic. Meaning that when we think of you know the good or bad, we think of them as something permanent. We think that our bad will last forever, that's where we get into depression. We think that our good is going to last forever. That's why we become arrogant. In Hashem's way, no one will ever get 1% more punishment than he deserves. Not 1%. So here, the punishment for, or the tikkun, or the test that Yosef HaTzadik had to go through was over. And Hashem said he will not suffer for even one second more than he needs to. So he made the Egyptians run him out of this jail. Now what about the reward system? Within a matter of hours, you have him going up there, changing his attire. First thing he's doing right away, actually, within a matter of minutes... Pharaoh asks, tells him, I've dreamt a dream, and I was told that you could interpret it. Now, if we were all in jail for 10, 12 years, and someone freed us based on their belief that we can do something, and they told us, listen, you can do this and that, what are we going to say? I can do it, of course, yeah, how many you want? <laughs> you know, it's how many you want? I can fix roofs, I can do this, I can interpret dreams, whatever you want, I can do it. Even if we can't do it, that's what we're going to do. He just got out of jail. If I tell him no, he's going to throw me back. That's not what Joseph does. Joseph says, no, it's beyond my capabilities. I can't transfer, tra interpret the dreams, but Hashem can. And, but, and hopefully he gives me the ability to interpret your dream. So I'm thinking to myself, lie, you fool. What do you mean you can't interpret dreams? Tell him that you can interpret dreams. He's going to throw you back in jail. But no, that's different. That's the difference between emunah that's logical and emunah that's complete. And that's the take. The complete emunah that Yosef had didn't matter whether it was favorable to him or not. So that's why he said, I can't do it. But Hashem can. Hopefully he gives me the ability to tell it to you. There was another person that uh, did it in the Torah, in the Tanakh, which was the prophet Daniel. When uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, call, you know, got him to uh, summoned him to interpret his dream. Daniel's response was that I can't interpret dreams. Hashem can. Uh, same same response as uh, Yosef Atzadik. So now he says I can't do it. Hashem can. And now we have something very very special that also explains how our reward system is very different than Hashem's. Hashem, you know, when we have a good time, when we're making money, we got a good deal, Some life's good in that end of life, we think that we're always going to be rich. I mean, I remember myself, from early parts of my life, I mean, times that I was very poor and times that I was very, very rich. I mean, I thought that both times would last forever, and I don't think I'm very different from anybody else, because I've talked to a lot of people over the years, and everyone thought the same thing. When times were good... Everyone thought that they were going to print money forever. When times were bad, it was the end of the world. But Hashem doesn't work that way. When the time comes for you to be rewarded, 
He doesn't need you to get promotions from your boss every six months or every year or every two years or every three years and follow the system that corporate America has. Hashem can reward you just like that, but in a natural way that's supernatural. How so? Tells us right here in this parasha that shortly after he translates the dream, Pharaoh says, do we have anybody else like him that has the spirit of God in him? We obviously don't. That means that you need to be the king. The viceroy, right below me. The only way I'll outrank you is for my being Pharaoh and me being the uh, number one. That's the only thing that'll outrank you. But you will have the number one position pretty much that no man in Egypt, which at that time meant the entire world really, because Egypt was the dominant civilization or empire in the world, no man will take a step without you knowing. He just got out of jail an hour ago. He was in jail for 12 years. He's been away from his family. He got bought, you know, sold by his brothers. He's been going through suffering day and night. He was just in the worst place on earth. And an hour later, or even less, he's number one in the world. That's not winning the lotto. That's winning life. That's winning everything. That's not natural. That's not logical. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing that for me, when I started this whole journey of tshuva and learning Torah on a much more regular basis and daily and, and got more and more into it, that I realized that there was a pattern in the Torah and maybe we'll start doing it on a weekly basis at least a little bit. There's a pattern in the Torah that's unlike any teaching you will ever have. And Baruch Hashem, I benefited in life where I had a lot of education. I liked education, I liked school. And I've learned a lot in schools and myself. So regardless of what it was, I've, always, I've tested a lot of things in my life. And I can tell you from my personal experience, there's nothing else in the world in it, I know for a fact, even without my experience, because I know what the Torah has, but the point is, even on the, the uh, excluding religion for a moment, I've tried a lot of different subjects, learning whether it's technology, science, uh, name it, I probably looked into it at some point or another in my life. One thing that the Torah has that nothing else in the world will ever have is that that shows that it's divine, shows that it cannot be man-made in any way, shape, or form, is that each parasha, each and every parasha that you have, in, that you will read every week, you have the different parasha, each and every parasha will have a lesson about life for you specifically at that time in your life. Meaning, if you study the parasha, each parasha has its time. First week, you have better sheets. Second week, you have, you know, each parasha has its time. Last week, we have me kids. Uh, this week, Vayigash. Next week, and so on. So each week, you have a different parasha. If you learn the parasha, the few pages of the parasha, it's not many pages, it's not that long, you will find, you, you guys, each one of you, and anyone that's watching this, you will find something that is related to your life that, will ch that can help you change your life at that moment that's relevant to you then. And I've seen it week after week, year after year. It's something amazing. I mean... Listen, you have people that have been religious their whole life, 50, 60, 70 years, 80 years sometimes. I mean, some of these older people are even more. But did you ever ask yourself, how could they still be reading the same book every week? I mean, yeah, of course, they read other books. They read the Gemara, they read the Zohar, they read this, they read this. But every week, every one of them has to read the Parashat Shavuah. 
and they all do. Do you ever think about why? Why? How could? How many times can you read the same book? I mean, how many times can you read Harry Potter? How many times can you read uh, Lord of the Rings? How many times can you read any of these books that they've created over, over time? Change it. It's the same thing. Okay, a few times, whatever. Okay, maybe it's interesting once, twice. Let's say you're a fanatic. Five times you've read the same book. I don't know. I've never heard of such a thing, but let's say you did. They've been reading it 80 times, 100 times, 200 times, 500 times. You already know it by heart. Why do you read it? Many of them know every pursuit by heart. Back in, you know, the real, the real uh, religious people, children that are 10, 12 years old know, know the entire Torah by heart. Why do they read it? You already know it. You know what the story says. It's not like I need to tell you what jo uh, Joseph is going to do right now. You already know by heart. You, not only do you know what happened, you know the word. So why would you even read it again? And that's the secret. The Torah is like the ocean. It's endless. You don't have a limit. You can read it a million times and still learn something new. And the most beautiful part about that I've seen personally is that every time you read the parasha, you will find something new, a lesson that's specifically to you. Not just a lesson that's general, that's, uh, oh, it's so nice that he succeeded and he won the lotto and blah, blah, blah. Great. Moses crossed the ocean and the ocean split and the um, pillar of fire went down and, you know, great. It's, the story is amazing. It's actually one of my favorite things to do. There's these stories, the Midrashim that they have is, is amazing. But there's more to it. You could find a lesson that's specific to your life. And that's something that's special. That's something that you cannot find in math, economics, science. Pick the subject, it doesn't matter. You cannot find it anywhere else. And it requires you to study it. And, and you could find it. And it's something really, really amazing. So I think that with last week's Palasha, we learned... Number one, Hashem's logic is very, very different than ours. Two, Hashem's punishment system, very different than our logic. Hashem reward system, very, very different than us. And something very, very cool that uh, I thought was a good question, and uh, I asked my cousin, uh, Ephraim, uh, Rabbi Ephraim Kachman, Amazing, he amazes me, he never, he never ceases to amaze me. And this is a question I asked him a while back. How did Pharaoh know that Joseph is telling the truth? Okay, so Pharaoh asked all of his khaltumim and wise men that he had to come and translate the dream. No one was able to translate the dream. He calls this guy that's been in jail for the last 12 years. The guy comes. He translates the dream and makes him a king. Yeah, right. You, you don't really believe that story. I mean, there has to be more. I mean, maybe Pharaoh was a rasha, but he wasn't a fool. How do you, I mean, how, did you ever ask that question? I mean, think about it. How do you know he's telling the truth? Because it's not like he said, listen, he, you know what? What he says makes sense. So therefore, you know what? All right, I'll take your advice. Okay, so we should save our money for the next, save our wheat and our food for the next seven years. And then we'll survive the seven years after that during the famine that's going to come in seven years from now. All right, yeah, you know what? It's never a bad thing to save. We're going to listen to your system. Thanks. Goodbye. I'll go back to jail or something. He didn't just say, oh, it's a good idea. He made the guy the visceral. He made him pretty much king and in charge of everything. So obviously he had to know this is true. So what does the Midrashim say? Pharaoh, like I said, was not a fool. So he tried to trick Joseph by telling him 
different parts of the dream that didn't happen. Like he told him the dream, but he told, told him about things that didn't actually happen in the dream. And Joseph said, no, 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 Hashem says that didn't happen. What you're saying to me didn't happen in your dream. This is what happened in the dream. So he didn't just tell him the translation or interpretation of the dream. He told him the dream itself. That's how he knew that God was with him. Say, say this in Torah? Midrashim, say it. Oh, okay. It says over here, it says the... Uh, um, the matter appeared good in Pharaoh's eyes and in the eyes of all his servants. Pharaoh said to his servants, Could we find another like him? A man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you of all this, there can be no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my place, and by my command shall all my people be sustained. Only by the throne shall I outrank you. So it's not just believing, it's seeing something. And it's a, uh, I mean, it talks about the, uh, how he translated the dream. He told him that the two dreams that he had were one dream. Uh, and the Rashi and the other Midrashim explain how, how did he get to that extreme where it's not just that he believed them, he makes them king moments later because he knew that everything he said has to be true. Uh, something similar happened with uh, Daniel, the prophet Daniel, uh, which is in a Tanakh, um, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar pretty much expected everyone to tell him his dream. And Daniel tells him what you are, you know, and he said that if you... Well, if, it's if about all, the, the big monster, something like that? Or yeah, it? he dreamt, uh, Nebuchadnezzar dreamt of a big uh, statue... And, uh, and the top of the statue was gold, gold. and uh, then it was silver, and it was different and all the way to the bottom, which was wood. And uh, it was actually Hashem giving him a prophecy of what the future uh, empires would look like, showing that he, that Nebuchadnezzar, and his empire in Babylon will be the strongest and have the most amount of control ever until the Mashiach comes. No one will have control of the world like he did. So he's the top. He's the uh, gold. gold. Uh, and then after that, you have the uh, Persians. And after that, you have the Greeks, and so on and so forth. So now, the Bukhanetzer pretty much um, summoned all of the wise men and all of the wizards and whoever pretty much was uh, uh, you know, on his payroll to, tr to tell him his dream and translate it. And if you can't, I'm going to kill you. So it wasn't like you had an option not to do it. You're either going to do it or I'm going to kill you because you're useless to me if you can't interpret my dream. So he, he put a decree that whoever couldn't do it, he's going to kill them. So he was only moments away from, uh, from executing this decree and killing all of these people. And then Daniel shows up and Daniel tells him what you are requesting them of them is impossible. There's no way that anyone can tell you the dream. I can't tell you a dream, but God can. And hopefully God can give me the insight to tell you. And he, and he did, and uh, he explained the dream to him. Um, and he made Daniel his number one guy, and, and, you know, and the story goes on. But the, uh, so the Torah repeated itself, but there's different lessons, same lessons and different lessons to learn from both. Um, and it's... Every one of these stories is Hashem didn't write us this Torah with special letters, with special valley system, with special laws, with strange events. I mean, each parasha has a different strange event, one after another. I mean, you just read the, in, in uh, Midrash about the uh, time when uh, uh, Hashem asked um, uh, Abraham to circumcise all of, you know, himself and all of the people, all of his slaves, all of the people that lived with him. So it was over, over 300, 318 at the minimum with the amount of people that he had.
because he took 318 people with him to war against the four kings. So he had to circumcise all of them. So the Midrashim explained that he had all of this uh, orla, all of the foreskin gathered. There was like a pile. And it's very graphic of what's there, what happens. That actually ends up being one of the places where you actually have the, uh, uh, the, 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 the where the Bet Mikdash had the sacrifice. So something strange like that I means one person, you know, one after another, you're doing circumcision. You have this horrendous picture in your mind, and the next thing you know, Hashem turns that into something that's extremely holy. So, the Torah has a lot of strange stories, but you can learn something from each one of them, and you see how they all connect somehow, one way or another. Maybe, you know, it's a, uh, I don't know if it's connecting, like I, it's connecting in my mind, but the point I'm trying to tell you guys is that when we go about things the way that Hashem told us to do it, I think it becomes, life becomes a lot easier. Do you guys have any questions or uh, something specific that uh, you guys want me to mention? Or do you want me to tell you uh, a story or two? Or do you want me to tell you to go to sleep? Which one? Uh, I think I'm going to go to sleep. Sleep? One, one I don't out, think one, one 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 about you about your post I think I think Toma Toma is half asleep also. <laughs> um, let me see. Hold on a second. All right, I read this really good story, and I'll let you guys go after that. Uh, good story today. Today, yesterday, something like that. Um. It has to do with uh, honoring someone who knows Torah. Um, even after, you know, you guys continue to learn. Every week we're learning, but the Zat Hashem, you guys start learning every day. One year, two years, five years, ten years, you know, you start accumulating knowledge. It's very easy to become arrogant about Torah. It's very easy to become arrogant about anything in life. It's part of our evil inclination and technically part of what mankind has become. Being arrogant is almost like an admired human characteristic. People don't admire humble people. People admire arrogant people. Uh, I'm not talking about righteous people. I'm talking about like when you're living the life of Torah. I'm talking about the world, when you see television, movies... The outside lie that the world is consumed with, who's admired? The people that are the most arrogant, they show themselves off, they show their bodies, they show their money, they show their all their whole thing. That's what people admire. So in Torah, it's such amazing information that when you learn it, it's very easy to actually become arrogant about it. Because, number one, you know that not a lot of people know it. And number two, it's, it's I don't know, it just, it's, it's a really, really good feeling. So the story has to do with that, where it's, it shows you what someone that really knows behaves like. So one time there was a, um, there was uh, three rabbis uh, that uh, sh- were traveling, uh, Rabbi Chia, Rabbi Abba and uh, the third one, uh, Rabbi Yossi. So they're traveling and they uh, they stop at one man's house and uh, they said, "Listen, you know, we're we're traveling. We're gonna stay by you." And you know, the, the the man lets them stay there. And they all wake up at midnight because they, uh, they have this ritual where every night they don't sleep past midnight. They go to sleep a little early and then they wake up at midnight and they start learning Torah. So the daughter of the, ho- of the homeowner comes to them and lights the candle for them and sits next, you know, sits uh, relatively far from them but enough, close enough to listen to their Torah. So they're starting to talk Torah, different things, they're learning different information and then... Uh, Rabbi Hia actually sees that the girl is listening 
and he switches the, his interpretation of one of the lessons they had to make it related to her. You know, you always want whoever is listening to want to relate to them. So he interprets it in a little bit of a different way, where he says he shows how this particular mitzvah has a lot to do, where it has a lot to do with the woman and the woman that's lighting the Shabbat uh, the Shabbat candle and how her lighting the Shabbat candle is so significant. And by also supporting our husband to go learn Torah, it's, a, uh, it's as if she's learning Torah. So naturally you would expect the woman to smile or be happy when she gets that type of interpretation, show that she's important. But instead she starts crying. And shortly after, her father comes out and he asks her why is she crying. And she tells him about what she just learned. And he starts crying. So the Rab- Rabbi Chia looks at both of them and he says, it seems like what I taught would touch the nerve about you know, a man learning to us. It looks to me that maybe you have a husband that doesn't know to us. And the father answers, that's all too true. Meaning it's, yeah, exactly. She has, uh, she has a husband who doesn't know anything. He's the most ignorant man I know. So, Rabbi, you're probably asking yourself, how could I let my daughter marry such an ignorant? You know, back then, Torah was everything. It's not like today where it's like some people know what it is and the rest of the world doesn't know anything. It's like, how could I let, how could I let my daughter marry somebody like that? Well, you know what? I saw this, I saw this boy jump off of a roof just to go make it into the synagogue because they're about to say Kaddish and he wanted to make it in time to say Amen. So when I saw how much he appreciates saying Kaddish and, and he knew how significant Kaddish is and how significant saying Amen to Kaddish is, where they say that it's the one that says Amen may actually get more credit than the one that's actually saying Kaddish. So for him to jump from such a high roof just to make it in time so he could hear the Kaddish and say amen to, I said, ah, he must know a lot of Torah. So they married each other a couple of months ago. <laughs> but since then, so I told him I liked the boy, I wanted him to marry him, and then they got married. But since then, the boy hasn't said one thing about Torah. He doesn't even know how to say Birkat Amazon. He doesn't even know what the Shema is. So that's why we cry. Shortly after, well, actually, the, the rabbi over here he responds, he goes, well, something tells me that if he can't, if he's not going to be the one that knows the Torah, you're going to have a child that's going to have a lot of Torah. So don't worry. Try to make them feel better, but they also knew things, these, these rabbis. It's not regular rabbis. Shortly after, the, the boy or the husband comes out, and he says, I have a statement to make. Say yes, and he starts. He mentions a verse in the Torah where he says, uh, "The um, interpreting pretty pretty much interpreted one of the verses of the Torah where he was saying that the ones that were young but knowledgeable." refrained from talking next to the elders out of respect. Because even though they knew, they had respect for the elder people, and they stayed quiet because they didn't want everyone to despise them. He goes, so me, being very, very young, I also did the same thing. When I just moved here a couple of months ago, I didn't want everyone to hate me because of what I know. So I, I, I promised myself, I made a vow that I would not say anything about Torah for two months. And today, right now, the two months are up. I'm a rid, and he tells him the story. And he starts giving them different things about Torah and everybody's baffled that this Torah is coming out of this guy. They didn't even think he knows what Kriyat Shema is. They didn't think he knows what Birkat Amazon is. They didn't think he knows anything. All of a sudden, he's seeing the Torah, like a computer. Like, 
He's like, who are you? Like, obviously we don't know who this guy is. He says, I'm from Babylon, and my father, who passed away before, I, uh, you know, when I was born, is Rabbi uh, Rav Safra, which is one of the biggest rabbis in history. And I learned everything that he taught, all of his stuff that he wrote, and you know, it's, and I, you know, and he started telling the rabbis, the three sages that I mentioned in the Gemara, and anyone that's mentioned by name in the Gemara, had the ability, or in essence, the kedusha, in order to to bring back the dead. That's that's how significant they were. He starts telling them things, and they respond to him like, "We've never seen, we've never learned anything like this before. Everything you're teaching us is new." So for them to say that he's teaching them something new, obviously this is something special. They say, please, continue, bring on, you know, uh, teach us the whole night, your Torah. And the whole night he's giving them secrets about the Torah, about everything. And he explained to them, the, the, I knew that I'm young and knowledgeable, but the way I was taught also is that just because you're young and knowledgeable doesn't mean you have to throw it around and just uh, take, take uh, you know, Take control. You have to see where everybody else is, where everybody else stands. You have to be honorable with your Torah and not just uh, arrogant with it. So, Be'ezat Hashem, we have that problem one day where we have too much Torah. But the point I'm trying to make to you is that with anything in life, anything in life, always think about things not just from your own position, but empathize. Think about things from the other people's positions. You know, if you're in business and you just got into a new business and you're killing it, you're doing really, really good, and you have this old timer that's also in the same business, but maybe he's not doing as good or maybe he's not as excited, don't throw your weight around just because you're the new it's kid on the block. Hard. You know? Have some respect. He's been around, he's been around the block, he's been doing it for a long time, he's seen people like you come and go. There's no need for you to show off that you're better or this or that. He was young once too. Have respect. It's very, very important to have respect in anything that you do in life. In Torah especially. But also it, it relates to our day-to-day -day things. It's very easy to be a show-off. It's very easy to be someone who who's, knows it all, especially when we're doing good. So it's important for us to be modest, down-to-earth, realistic, and know that... Listen, what's today is today. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be tomorrow. Just take advantage of whatever you can, but also at the same time be humble. And Be'ezot Hashem, Hashem will continue to bless. Be'ezot Hashem, Hashem will have another Shio next week. And uh, you guys have any questions during the rest of the week, let me know. If you have any, ish, any things you want to learn about next week, maybe we'll learn about the Palasha if you want, or we'll learn about other things. But uh Hashem, we learned some things and we'll continue to uh continue to learn. So now that we